Hello guys! Well, the last, the last theme that we are missing is called Welfare Theorems. It has nothing to do with what we saw about welfare, the research you did. I mean, of course, it's welfare, so it has something to do. But um, it's not about measuring how much the welfare of an agent was affected by a change in prices. That's not the case. That was the case of your research. Here, what we are going to, to talk about, it's about the welfare of the agents when the market works. So in the general equilibrium setting, okay? We will start by, uh, by going again through the concept of efficiency. Yes? Remember that we said that efficiency was like the big promise of the economist. We didn't say that markets were going to be nice markets, whatever nice means. We didn't say as well that everyone would get the highest utility possible. We didn't say that as well, right? What we said was that if there was a solution, it was going to be efficient, but not any efficiency, but efficient in the sense of Pareto, okay? So even though you already had the definition, let me recall it, for example, a uh, feasible allocation X will be weakly Pareto efficient if there exists no any other feasible allocation X prime such that all agents strictly prefer X prime to X. Okay? This is very important because I am asking that there exists no other such that all agents strictly prefer X prime to X. Okay? But, for example, in strong Pareto efficiency, I am saying that if there is not any feasible allocation X prime, such that all agents weakly prefer X prime to X, and some strictly prefer X prime to X. So, my question is, in all the, home, all the work and all the exercises we have been looking at for the edge root box, what have we been looking for, for a weak Pareto efficient allocation or a strong Pareto efficient allocation? Can you guess? Remember, we said everyone should be better off or the same. Hence, I am looking forward to have an allocation such that there exists no other which all agents strictly prefer X prime to X. So, uh, we have been working with weak Pareto efficiency. Yes? So, um, let me go to the following slide and I am going to give you the two welfare theorems. Okay, so this is the first welfare theorem. The first welfare theorem is something that we have been looking in the general equilibrium work and in the general equilibrium model. Um, remember we said the market will be free, free in the sense that nobody will be asked to go and trade. If you go and trade it's because you want to. That means that you have a trading zone where you are going to be willing to trade. Yes. And another feature that we have been looking at is the contract theory, the, the co contract curve, sorry. So the contract curve is the curve that, uh, that describes all the Pareto efficient allocations. So I join all the Pareto efficient allocations in the economy. Yes, there is not only one efficient allocation. In particular, if the preferences are monotone, remember that having everything in one side and zero in the other one, it's a point that will be Pareto efficient. Yes, and what we have been looking at is that the Valrassian equilibrium is not only inside the trading zone, but it is in the contract curve. That means that it is Pareto efficient. So our first welfare theorem just states that. It says, if XP is a Valrassian equilibrium, then X 
Remember, x is my final allocation, is Pareto efficient. So you already have this known. You already knew this. You already knew that if x was part of the Valrhagian equilibrium, then it was going to be Pareto efficient, meaning that it was going to rely in the contract curve. Yes? Now, the proof is by contradiction. As you can see, in this theorem, I have two sections. The first section says, if, uh, um, if I have that x beats a Valrhagian equilibrium, then x is Pareto efficient. This first part is the fact. Yes, so I know that x beats a Valrhagian equilibrium. What I should prove is that x is Pareto efficient. Okay, so if I am going to prove this by contradiction, I am going to contradict the implication, not the fact. So I know for sure that x beats a Valrhagian equilibrium. What I am going to say is that x, which is part of the Valrhagian equilibrium, is not Pareto efficient. So, I have here, suppose that x is not Pareto efficient. However, as I said before, the fact is that x is part of the Valrhagian equilibrium. Yes? Well, now, as I said that x is not Pareto efficient, then what does that imply? It implies that there exists another allocation x prime, that it's feasible, such that is strictly preferred to all agents versus x. Remember that I just told you that we were using the Pareto efficiency in the weak sense, yes? And by definition, the Pareto efficiency in the weak sense states that there exists no other feasible allocation x prime that it's strictly preferred by all agents, yes? So as x is not Pareto efficient, then that other allocation x prime does exist, yes? If that is true, that means that the utility of x prime is larger than the utility I have under the allocation x, and not only for me, but for everyone, yes? Furthermore, I said that this x prime, this x prime is feasible. What does feasibility mean? it means that I can buy it, right? So why was that x was my decision and x prime was not my decision? If x is part of the Valrhagian equilibrium, x comes from the problem of the optimization of the utility subject to my budget constraint. So remember, if x is the allocation that maximized my utility, I didn't choose x prime, maybe because it was more expensive. So expensive that I couldn't even afford it. Yes? So it must be the case that what I spend under x prime, it's above of my possible income. Yes? Okay, now. What happens? Adding up that condition for all agents, so I am going to sum everything, and taking the budget constraint as binding, yes, and knowing that x prime was feasible, what happens? If x prime was feasible, then it could not be, yes, it could not be in reality that it was more expensive than x prime. But that contradicts the fact that I didn't choose x prime over x. Yes? So if I am going to demand something, it's because there is nothing more, uh, there is no other allocation which is feasible, hence I can afford it, that gives me a higher satisfaction. So it's a very intuitive proof. If xp is a Valrhagian equilibrium, then x is better sufficient. Okay, but let me tell you something. This theorem is not an if and only if. Yes, I am just saying, if you give me a Valrhagian equilibrium, so x 
comes from the utility maximization problem, and P are those prices that makes the demand equal to the supply, then the location you will find will be Pareto efficient. Now, I don't have in this theorem the opposite. I am not saying that if X is Pareto efficient, I will find that it is a Valgrassian equilibrium. That's not what I am saying. Okay? Just think about this Edgeworth box. In this Edgeworth box, I can have all these points in the contract curve. Yes, if this was their initial location, then I will find that the Valrassian equilibrium must be somewhere inside the trading zone, but under the contract curve, so somewhere in here. However, this point is also quite sufficient, but it's not the Valrassian equilibrium. Hence, the first welfare theorem states only if X is a Valrassian equilibrium, then X is Pareto efficient. But here I show you that I cannot say the opposite because this point over here was Pareto efficient but not a Valrassian equilibrium. Okay guys, so in a second video I will put you the second welfare theorem.